colleagues, a warm welcome to the annual Horace's Global Virtual Meeting, held under the theme Fostering Shared Humanity. I am Metin Saik Guvener, founding chairman of the Salon, a forward-thinking and pioneering platform developing innovative collaborations with academic, entrepreneurial, cultural, and philanthropic partners to focus on lives. I hope most of us have the opportunity to enjoy the various plenary and parallel discussions which took part before our session. I look, I'd like to thank Dr. Frank for his kind invitation for myself to chair the panel of fostering shared happiness and meaning post-COVID, and more importantly, for inviting our esteemed leadership or panelists and audience to share in our discussion together. I believe we are synchronized to meet one another to bring out the best in each other through the toolbox in the making. I also believe that reflection brings realization, may bring transformation and resonance if we have the right tools in our toolbox. Let us enrich our tools all together during this valuable time. Before we hear our panelists' individual perspectives, I would like to share a few thoughts and collectively reflect upon how we can foster shared happiness and meaning post-COVID. Don't we all spend our time trying to understand self and relating to others in the pursuit of happiness? While the personal nature of happiness makes it difficult to describe because it is particular to each individual and their circumstances, there seem to be some common needs that we all share with regard to experiencing or achieving happiness, but I believe that our basic needs for shelter, food, and company need to be fulfilled before we can experience it. Reiterating our panel's stimulus for discussion, the control, measures, and the worry about COVID have depressed many people. At the same time, both vaccination hesitancy and lack of clear information about the vaccination timings have not assured uh, 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 worries. If there is a next time, what can be done better? What lessons will be learned by society to benefit lives priorities, or even develop positive personality changes. Our panel today brings together individual, individuals who have been nourished and grown in different environments, yet have emerged onto the same platform today to reflect on this profound topic. Conscious of the time allocated for 45 minutes, without further delay, may I kindly ask the panelists to raise your hand when your name is being mentioned for our audience to familiarize with each one of you. I'm delighted to invite and please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists onto the virtual stage to share their heartfelt stories, experiences, expertise, and opinions regarding the subject in discussion. Anikan Day, founder of Chief Executive Officer, Corporate Spring USA. Luis Golardo, President, World Happiness Foundation USA. Elizabeth Markle, Executive Director and Founder, Open Source Wellness USA. Pagriti Poder, Global Head of Mental Health and Wellbeing, Ram Glass, India. Thank you for joining us today. Now over to our first round of discussions. I invite each panelist to take four minutes to share and expand on your personal experience with respect to the discussion of the day. It would be interesting to hear your impression of the disruption of the COVID has caused our personal and wider global communities, and lasting effects that you feel have arisen from this experience, perhaps related to personal sense of purpose and drive. Annika, would you please floor, take the floor? Thank you so much, Metin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and nice to meet you all and all the listeners as well. Um, so I would take the, the perspective, actually, a little bit of how the COVID-19 has impacted the business world. Uh, because that is this uh, there that I work in. Um, I'm on a mission, my company is on a mission to make the corporate world a happier place. And of course, uh, it has been severely impacted uh, this last year. And the level of happiness in general, I think, uh, has been challenged for many reasons and rightfully so. But what has been very interesting is to see how um, the different organizations and leaders have handled this and, and kind of new priorities that has arisen as a consequence of the COVID-19. And basically what we are seeing and you know, what a lot of research is seeing and we're seeing with our clients is like people have 
like two different, very different approaches. One is like going into the survival mode, which I think the majority of companies will have been taking. And that is basically just keeping head over water and survive and waiting for this to pass. Um, well, you have the, the other way of looking at it is seeing this as an opportunity to start doing things differently, to reinvent yourself and to transform the way you work and also start building different habits and ways of working uh, for the future. So when you also look at um, these are more like how companies approach it, but from leaders, we've seen also a big difference in how they are uh, focusing on the human side of their business. Uh, talking about wellness, talking about mental health, talking about happiness is things that hasn't necessarily been that normal among the leaders, but now they haven't had much of a choice. So basically, if I look at um, the, 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 what I hope will be the positive consequences of this pandemic, and I, I know there's many bad consequences, I'm not, and that's not what I'm, I'm here to talk about, but the positive consequences is a new awareness uh, around the need of uh, the human aspect and helping people handle not only this crisis, but handle life also after. So investing in people, investing in people's happiness and, and well-being, I believe and hope is going to be a bigger focus moving forward. But also here we see some leaders think now it's, um, you know, it's only for getting people through the pandemic. But what you know, we try to help companies do is to make it part of their ongoing culture and ongoing way of working. Fantastic. Thanks. That's, that's a very positive contribution, I think, to the mindsets of a lot of entrepreneurs that you're helping. That's great. Luis, our uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as the founder and president of the World Happiness Foundation, and the World Happiness Fest, the topic is, is very relevant. Um, let me share with you that actually uh, we organize our big event. We, are, we actually have the largest event in the world focused on happiness and well-being during March 20th, which is International Day of Happiness. And if you remember, that's when a COVID actually started a back, not this March, but the March before. Um, it was a few months, uh, but actually it was March 16 when everything started to collapse in so many places around the world. So I think that uh, even for us was huge impact because we normally organize 80 events around the world at the same time and we have to move everything online. So we move uh, very fast and we were able to organize them. But the first thing that people were asking is how can you, how can how can you be talking about happiness when uh, all this is happening? Happening, and actually the answer is very is very easy once we look at what uh, happiness can impact uh, human beings on. And basically, the way we understand happiness is the is, is like a enabler, is a catalyst, is the way we can maximize our our impact at the individual level and the collective level when we share it. So actually happiness, happiness is not just something that you own and that is for you. Uh, our philosophy is that the more you share it, the more impact, positive impact you are having around the world. That's why uh, we support and we've been behind two United Nations resolutions. One is uh, actually creating the day, International Day of Happiness, and that, that happened eight years ago. And the second one is um, creating new paradigms for human progress based on happiness and well-being. So we are super thrilled to see many institutions around the world taking uh, happiness seriously because uh, it, the impact, the, 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 the shorter impact is on mental health. And that's why uh, when we saw COVID, we really accelerated the impact on working on happiness and well-being because the first impact that you see is that it has a critical impact on our state of mind. So when we understand happiness as a state of mind, then we understand that we have to understand our mind. And once we go into our mind, it's not just our brain, we have to understand our thoughts. And then when you realize that actually the biggest pandemic today in the world is not COVID, 
is loneliness, then you realize that you have a um, Molotov cocktail when you combine COVID with loneliness. And actually we were really shocked by the World Health Organization uh, making a first mistake, which was calling physical distancing, social distancing. Mm -hmm. Because that created so much alarm and so much confusion. Probably, they, of course, the intention was right, but words were wrong. Uh, because when you talk about social distancing, it's about people becoming less social. And actually, what we were saying is, no, just be six feet away. That's it. But th there, you understand how we don't get it as humankind, how we overestimate, in many ways, the power of economy, and how we underestimate that actually it's all about health and it's all about education. So basically, as a first reflection, say that from the World Happiness Foundation, we are here to create awareness around freedom, consciousness, and happiness working together. And we really thank all the organizations in the world uh, focusing on mental health, because this is the big, 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 big elephant in the room today. How we are going to be dealing with not just with loneliness, but with the, with the whole impact that this COVID is going to bring to all of us. Thank you very much. We'll expand on these ideas a bit later on as well. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Well, I'm so glad that you spoke to loneliness. And Metin, I'm so glad that you spoke to common needs because those very much relate to what I want to share. Um, I'm a psychologist by training. And before founding Open Source Wellness, I worked in healthcare. And, and to this day, we work in deep partnership with big healthcare systems and little teeny clinics. And here's something that's just true. Before COVID and during COVID, when patients go to see their doctors and their therapists and their case managers and their social worker, all the people who are in positions of caring for folks who are experiencing suffering or vulnerability, um, they are told four big things. No matter whether their diagnosis is diabetes or depression or anxiety, they're told four things. Number one is you should exercise more. Number two is you need to eat better. Number three is reduce your stress. I hope that's helpful. Um, and number four is you need some social support or some meaningful connection in your life. And then unfortunately, providers and therapists often then say something like, good luck with that. Take care now. Best of luck creating that in your life. And what I want to reflect on is that those four things, physical activity, healthy food, stress reduction or findings, inner calm, and social connection are common needs. They're fundamental. They're transdiagnostic. They're both preventative and remedial. And we need social structures that deliver them at the level of the population that are not dependent on wealth, Right? It's not just the people who can shop at Whole Foods and take up Pilates and hire a private health coach that need this. And they need to not be dependent on willpower, right? that you have to sort of work really hard and effort to care for yourself in these ways. And so part of what happened with COVID is that the structures, the social structures that helped people do those four things, many of them fell away. And people were left to either generate those practices of self-care and community care on their own, or they didn't. And so at Open Source Wellness, we speak about community as medicine all the time. That is how we think of it, that, it, that together in community, in relationships, we engage in and generate the practices that hold people in physical health, and psychological health, and social health. So if there's another time, and I pray there is not, I hope we are much, much better prepared to generate that collectively. And I'll pause there. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. The part to further collaborations as a whole. Uh, Prakriti, floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Um, it's actually lovely to be here and great to hear all of you. And we're all like aligned to the same cause and the same purpose, which is fantastic. Um, and, you know, from where my uh, sort of lens is, Happiness is such a far away word, right? Like, I mean, happiness is not a word that people look at. I mean, peace, maybe uh, suffering is kind of like something that they take ownership of. Um, and I remember once I had a conversation with this uh, a very senior journalist in India, and uh, she's very vocal as well. And I said, you know, we're doing all this work to, to ensure uh, that people begin to feel their own um, inner happiness. And she was offended. 
she was really offended with me she was like why are you saying things like that when was the last time that you think anybody felt uh, utterly happy that you would even claim that um and so you know it made me think because we were, i was working with women in slums at that point you know people who who really had no means and and uh, of course our foundation does a lot of work um with these uh you know in these domains with people who are economically uh you know from weaker sections of society um but also i mean there especially given this period um there's been a a, a democratization of ill health uh and uh therefore well being uh has to also be democratized it cannot be and like uh like you said uh, elizabeth it cannot be for the rich who can afford to go to whole foods it cannot be uh for people who who, um, who have means uh and when you have mental imbalances you do not have will power in any case so i mean i love the fact that you brought that up i mean there is no uh there is no way to gain happiness if you're coming at it from the point of view of achievement or um of a mission because the moment it's on a mission of happiness you're moving away so what i love about the 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 title of this is basically you know fostering shared happiness and meaning and meaning is the part that i want to focus on because because meaning is what i think will will drive the change that we're looking at and bring about the kind of feelings of the the, the fostering of like positive feelings um and i think that you know in 2000 i started doing this work and um all the way till now i mean i especially for the covid period i started a helpline which has 700 volunteers on it who take calls and the idea was that, you know there's so much stigma around mental health is there something that we can do where people can reach out to us anonymously and uh, we have corporates and we're talking about corporate by b we have corporates who who will call us up and say can you please do a a mental health care program for us and our people and the the program will be there but nobody comes out and actually talks about the illnesses or the or the dichotomy in there in, in this the situation is that it's still so stigmatized that nobody wants to come out and talk about it so what happens is that you have you have avenues but you have no takers for that path because they're so apprehensive that it isn't as as um it isn't as private as it should be and on the other hand on the helpline um you know one would have thought it's a free helpline people will call it and uh, access uh, you know counselors who are doing a simple cbt model of counseling uh, which is not very intense you can just reach out to anybody and have that conversation people loved it and shared it with other people but the people that called it were very few and far between and that is because most of the perpetrators were in your house and the houses are small so if your houses are small and you can hear it on the phone and there's nowhere to go you can't have those conversations in private you risk physical violence physical abuse etc so even though we're setting up you know obviously setting up um avenues for them we have to be really cognizant of the fact that really think about what can you actually give them and what can they actually take so even though we're providing community and community sources can people access them and how do you actually increase that access to foster this kind of shared happiness i mean I'm, we have many rounds so i'll stop there and then we can continue well thank you very much and touching on very pragmatic and real on ground uh, activities um we'll go thank you for sharing all the interpretations and thoughts now we are on to the second round the pursuit of happiness is one that <clears throat> excuse me humans have been working towards since the beginning of time most of us probably don't believe we need a formal definition of happiness we know it when we feel it and we often use the term to describe a range of positive emotions including joy pride contentment and gratitude i would like to request each panelist to take 2 minutes to share and expand on their personal experience with respect to what are your individual interpretations of the word and why is it important for our global future that we are happy can we achieve shared happiness what are the barriers to achieving it anika <laughs> you're giving us quite a challenge here those questions in 2 minutes <laughs> okay I'll, i'll i'll go as far as i can and you have to stop me back you can do 3 minutes uh, we have just uh, yeah. uh, let me start with you what <laughs> <laughs> uh individual how i see happiness uh very much something that that comes from within something that you know i i'm always uh surprised to see that the people that cut maybe on normal standards would not expect to be the happiest often are and it is very much about how they approach situations or how they approach the world 
um, instead of what the external circumstances are like. Um, having grown up um, in, a, in a country that has been named the best, happiest place to work in the world uh, many years in a row, uh, so that's Norway, uh, I'm privileged and lucky to never have, have been worried about being safe or having food or having a roof over the table. So, so that is, but when you walk down the street of Oslo, um, you don't see people dancing around the streets. Uh, they don't look happy, but they are content and they're safe. So yes, that is one kind of definition of happiness. But the happiness for me personally is much more that energy, that kind of that bubbles from within, which I think and believe we all can find in most situations, uh, even the grim ones. And, and personally, I must say that has my ability to find happiness in whatever uh, situation I'm in has saved me from a lot of situations that might not have been ideal or, but basically turning your, um, your uh, focus and your energy towards, okay, so this is what actually feels good about this and being happy, even though you're kind of miserable. So that, that is my personal, um, when you ask about how we can achieve happiness and, and, and what is the obstacles. Uh, so what we do and, and my company, and uh, I personally, I work with organizations and actually helping them achieve happiness at work, which for some people is outrageous because they think like, what on earth would I be happy at work? And uh, year after year, Gallup shows that nine out of 10 workers are not happy in the workplace. Um, it shows that uh, happy, highly engaged workplaces, they um, deliver 50% better results. So basically the fact that workers around the world don't are you know not, not happy at work it costs the global economy seven trillion US dollars every year so so making employees happy people happy that is actually one of the most useful leadership skills that there is and still very few leaders consider themselves like a happiness officer or it's my job to make people feel good when they come to work or anything but this is what we help people doing and and it needs to start with the leaders like how can they find joy and happiness and ex exclude that, you know, in their leadership role and uh, also help people do that. And it has a lot to do with, you know, um, awareness, mental training and having people like learn to choose one's mindset. And that's easier said than done. But what we see is people who actually learn the ability to look for the good in things, they naturally become happier. Uh, look for the things we're grateful for, naturally become happier. I see you start laughing now, but I, I'm sure those three minutes are over. <laughs> but you're just like... <laughs> yeah, we are all happy because we are laughing. <laughs> Thank you very much, Annika. I think we can move to it, But I'll, I'll stop there. But yes, that's that's um, that's my um, input for this. It's, it's, it's great. There's a lot of content there that we'll reflect on for sure. Luis? Yes, this is a big question because if we don't define things, then it's difficult to measure them, mm -hmm. uh, and it's difficult to get it's difficult to get a uh, buying in if you want to be strategic about things. And in this case, I'm talking about how do we get more leaders around the world at the corporate level, at the political level, uh, doing their job, which is people's well-being and people's happiness. So, uh, and it's interesting because you become a politician to bring well-being to your people, but then in the middle of the journey, you forget about it. And then you keep uh, taking care of yourself before your people. So I think that is very important. And when we look at uh, the standards uh, and we look at positive psychology, we look at the way the science of happiness has been evolving. I think that we all agree that it's, a, it's, an, it's an emotional state. It's a state of being. Because it's an emotional state, that's one state that's when the issue comes. Because we are really bad at understanding emotions. We are really bad at managing emotions. And that's where the hard work starts. And this is what we are definitely pushing. Uh, and that's why we are pushing the political and, and corporate agendas into social emotional learning. Because you have to start being smart and being intelligent about emotions in order to manage them and in order to understand them. So I think that for me, the state of mind, the state of being is an emotional state. And it's true that the closer you get 
to align happiness with purpose, uh, you are going to get in a, in a really meaningful state. But something, dif- something important, we can talk about that later, when we talk about purpose, is that most of us got it wrong. Uh, because we think that purpose is to do something. We think that purpose is our vocation, is to actually do something in life. But actually, purpose has nothing to do with doing. It's all about being. So, uh, and this is a deep conversation because we think that happiness is purpose, but we understand purpose as, as doing, we get it wrong. So my recommendation is that we get it right from the beginning. We are smart about emotions and we are smart about purpose and purpose is about being, not doing. Fascinating points. Um, I'm completely resonating. Elizabeth, over to you, please. Well, I'm loving this conversation. So I want to first say that happiness is very, very relative. So if anybody has been, you know, out for a walk and they're maybe grumpy about something they have to do that day or, you know, there's something irritating them. There's some small malady um, and, and it could be a beautiful sunny day, but we are still grumpy about something. We could be in the exact same moment, but if that's when you got the test results learning that your cancer was in remission or your mother is out of the hospital and well, you're in a completely different emotional state, right? Same circumstances, completely different experience of happiness. So I'm, I'm with Luis that it's an emotional state. And I think it's so highly relative. I think, I think our internal happiness is based on our, our internal uh, responses to the questions we're sort of asking ourselves, like, how are things going? Am I living well? Am I, am I having a good life? And the answer to that is so cultural, right? 500 years ago, what having a good life meant, or around the country today, around the world today, it means something very different. So highly relative to our own state, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and relative to who and where we are in in humanity. But you asked about our personal experiences, so I'll tell you what's true for me. I feel happy when I have the sense that I'm living well, right, that my body is well, that I'm enjoying where I am and what I'm up to, that my, my family and my relations are well, and when I know myself to be a positive contribution, And that's an identity piece. When I can say, I am a contribution to others, I have a sense of happiness. And that's highly enculturated, right? That's conditioned into me that that's important. But whether it's via my doing or my being, and I love that you brought that distinction in, when I can say, yes, I am making a difference for somebody somewhere, that contributes to a state of happiness for me. Thank you so much. You are illuminating as you are expressing it. <laughs> I think it was coming with me. I could just see it. Uh, yeah, Prakriti, over to you, please. Thank you. Um, I have to agree, starting with the uh, personal happiness, um, you know, which is you know doing the things that make you feel like you're in flow. And and I have I have so many actually so many things that make me feel like that, including uh, playing tennis. <laughs> and if I have like great friends to play tennis with, it's even better and more. Uh, it creates more happiness. I have three children, and uh, and uh, when they're well, I, I feel happy. Uh, today, one one is not well, so I'm like a little bit like distracted. <laughs> and then, um, you know, I've been a person who's always advocating happiness to be something intrinsic, which goes beyond. Uh, the things that you do beyond the things that you feel like are based on accomplishments that were carried forward by maybe genetics and uh, nurturing. Uh, Because a lot of people, uh, you know, when I say that, um, again, it's so cultural and we are, at least from the cultures that I work with as well, we're so much a part of the system that we're brought up in. We're not a part of, like, we don't have this unique identity of the I, me, myself. Like, we're always doing things for the community, uh, which includes your parents, your grandparents, like everybody around you. And uh, and when you link your achievements based on what their expectations are, people's expectations are of you, you automatically de-link your control over your own happiness. And I think that, uh, you know, something... Uh, something really, I mean, this is a really important piece because, um, I mean, I work with people. I have I have a, a clinic as well uh, with counselors and therapists and uh, psychiatrists. And um, and I've noticed when people come in, 
Uh, there are even, you know, people who are like, who are, you know, 40, 50, who walk in with their parents um, because that's the culture there. And, uh, you know, I haven't seen very different in, uh, in, in when I come out and I'm in Canada and I've, I, I'm Canadian, so I spend half my life here and half my life there. Uh, out here, people feel the opposite. They have nobody to walk in with. And, you know, going back to the, the part where Louis mentioned that loneliness has become a really, really big burden to bear. Um, we also have noticed right now that uh, people are not grieving uh, to the level that they that they're not aware enough that a lot of what they're going through is grief uh, and, and, and loneliness is part of that. But they're going through grief of having lost parts of themselves to the pandemic. Um, and so how do we build that? So even when we're looking at, at a corporate workplace and how do you become sensitive as a leader in your organization to understand that, um, you know, it is people are going through what's, what's external um, in terms of the external uh, applications of the environment are causing ill health, uh, are, causing, are causing not only you to feel a certain way, but those become our barriers to achieving that because we, we, we don't, Go back to square one, and I and our company, which is a, a company called Round Glass that I work with, and we're building so much in terms of meditation and mindfulness because the only thing to do really is to turn turn yourself inward and to yeah. in. We appreciate so much uh, heartfelt input that is going into the societies. I mean, it's very touching, and thank you all sharing your heart wave. I mean, this was really, really authentically resonating uh, to the audience. Now we are going to go to our third round, and I would like to request each panelist to take one minute and pinpoint one tool uh, you think each person should have in their personal toolbox that, beginning with themselves, will help create positive impact with the legacy of the experience of the COVID. Uh, Anakin. Okay, so um, my one tool will be... Uh, to be making, um, learn how to make deliberate choices. A little bit what I, I started with, uh, learning to uh, understand actually why you react the way you do. So Louise talked about emotions and, and to be intelligent about your emotions or understand your emotions better in order to handle the situation. So I think me personally, I use this every day. Uh, I use it with the, the leaders that I coach is like, Whatever situation you are in, there's like basically two paths you can choose. You can go one way and focus on all the things that's bad, or you can go the other and look at the good things. And it's very simple, and some call it almost naive way of looking at the world sometimes. But I do know that me and the people that I know around me that use the same mentality of like, okay, we're in the situation. I have two seconds to decide which route to let my brain go and decide the direction that uh, leads to the most positive outcome or, or just makes me feel the best. That is a tool that I will recommend and that I use. We have many choices in a day, so I love that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Luis? Yeah, well, uh, we have a whole toolbox. If anybody wants tools, we can give you a lot. Uh, I will focus on one, uh, which is uh, self-compassion. Uh, I feel that if we have to start with something is really actually taking care of ourselves and loving ourselves. Um, we are missing that. The only thing the world needs is really to be that each of us is centered, that each of us is really, really focused on, um, on love for themselves. The moment we do that as humanity, we heal the world. Uh, we normally focus on conditions. Uh, and no, we don't have to focus on any conditions. We just fo have to focus on on loving ourselves. And if you want to build on that, a uh, breathe. Uh, so whatever is a breathing technique, from a power one minute to 45 minutes meditation, that's the way you are going to be awakened yourself. yourself. Oh. If you imagine in the last about um, 30 minutes or so, 35 minutes, there's a lot of, that we learned. I already learned from just listening to you. So I hope the audience feeling the same. Um, over to Elizabeth. Well, Luis, you keep saying exactly the thing I would say, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go for the next step here. Yeah, I would say if I could give everybody one tool, 
it would be a two-step process. Maybe that's cheating. And that would be first the capacity to tell oneself the truth in a kind and compassionate way. This is what's happening now, right? I am lonely. I am depressed. I am eating a lot of ice cream. I am in poverty. Whatever it is, naming what's true for them without guilt, shame, self-recrimination, what if, all the things that derail progress. So truth with compassion, followed by the capacity to ask oneself, and now what would I like? What is my desire? What is the spark of aliveness that will pull me towards creating that which I most desire and what, to the best of my ability, brings happiness? So truth followed by desire, all wrapped up in self-compassion would be the gift I would want to give. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, thank you. Prakriti, please. Um, I think the, the, the tools are so incredible. Um, I think also like, uh, added to that, uh, Elizabeth, I think uh, what I would like people to also recognize is, is what are your innate you know, responses? I mean, what is your innate uh, go-to reaction to things that happen around you? And we already know through um, psychology that there's fight, fly, freeze, and fold. Um, and if, if you can just recognize that and put a, a mark there and say, okay, here's where I'm at, and uh, you know, give yourself a percentage and move forward by using the tools of resilience such as um, such as journaling uh, trying to get to uh, trying to get to a desired state and then working towards that very similar to what Elizabeth said it's it's all about building your own internal awareness and being your own guard to check yourself uh, to grow that resilience piece within your within your own self it becomes intrinsic to uh, how do you create uh, happiness and change the neural pathways that exist because once you recognize it and you you prepare yourself to challenge it and then to create a happy uh, happier uh, you know step towards more happier outcomes i think that would be a really good uh, tool for somebody thank you very very much um, as i said i'm learning every moment and before we open the floor to the wider audience i would like to invite each panel to share the name of one book that has inspired your journey or influence you and that you can see that it will change uh, transform somebody else's life so please just uh, have a think about that and in that if you can also mention one moment that a mentor has touched your life or a mentor can touch somebody else the mentorship one is the book that you recommend and the other is a mentorship it's important and how can we interactive more as mentor mentor just i think another one minute each and then we'll just uh, have the questions i have uh, yeah i think two three questions we'll choose according to time one or two questions that will follow after this one please but or to you uh, and then well, we can start again in the same <laughs> this was meant to be west to east but i think we are all on the west so i think it just okay, I was the first and then just go forever, <laughs> however you like if I say something really profound, I'm like, oh, I should have said that. Oh, I should have said that. <laughs> I'm not really good at following rules. Uh, so uh, so I'll, I'll mention two books. I'll start with this one just because I read it for the thir third time. Um, oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Whoa. Okay. It's a sign. Anyway, and this is all about signs, by the way. Uh, and I just uh, asked my, my daughter to read it. She's 24. She's a musician. Uh, she gave it to her friends. And it's it's transforming people just because when you read it, you kind of reminded of amazing life is and when you just listen to it. And then because I'm not good at following the rules, and I don't know uh, if I'm even allowed to do this, but I'll still do it. And this is my book. It's called Fly Butterfly. And because this is a happiness theme and we're talking about happiness, I just want to mention, because that's actually what I've been writing about as well, is how a woman in the corporate world um, breaks free from that, uh, goes to Hawaii and finds herself. And not only does she uh, become happy in her life, but she also decides to bring happiness back into the corporate world. Um, and um, yeah, so that's, uh, I, I used up all my time in, in because I took two books, but that's fine. Uh, I'll move on. <laughs> we, we are honored that you are sharing your book. How can that be a, a taboo not to? That's beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Louisa, I think. Uh, okay, well, I can share my book too. No. <laughs> uh, of course, Happy Talism. 
That's the, that's the new paradigm. I invite you to explore uh, why capitalism is critical for us as humans to evolve. Uh, but actually one that I love is uh, Ken Wilber, mm. basically the theory of everything. So it's, it's, it's deep, but actually it's the theory of everything. It's yeah. the theory of everything. So you don't need anything else uh, but Ken Wilber's. Um, I feel that uh, something interesting for this topic is that what I invite people is that uh, we move happiness from our rational space to our experiential space. And that's how we are, re are really going to achieve a lot. Uh, being experimental and experiential is super important. So in this case, I would recommend book, but I would recommend as well to be in nature, to be with friends and actually enjoy life. Fantastic. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you very much. We have uh, two questions that, uh, I'll, according to time, I'm choosing. Uh, it feels like this summer marks a kind of worldwide revitalization post-COVID. How can this feeling of renewal and change be harnessed and brought to its full potential? Anakin, you can go forward. Uh, we miss out the books from and mentors from uh, the. I don't think we went the whole round. This was just the. Uh, oh, sorry. Movie. Yeah, so, okay. then let's carry on and then this covers that uh, aspect as well. Yes, please go forward. I'd love to hear Elizabeth about the book. <laughs> what? Well, I'll be very brief then, because we've heard about my, this. My, my very sincere apologies. I, I missed that. Good. My very sincere apologies, yes. Well, Not to worry. I think what has been magic about this book is that it it reframes creativity as a generative act of contribution, that it's not something that only great artists or if you're going to be famous, you do it, but that it's a that it's a process of, of being human um, and, it, and it centers creativity and experiential goodness, as Luis um, named it beautifully. So that has made a, a big difference for me. And what I'll say about mentorship so briefly is that I've, I've had the privilege to live in community. I live in a co-housing community, and that's a, the topic of another whole session. But by being exposed, not just to your nuclear family or your partner, but to many adults who are doing all kinds of fascinating thing in the world, you have the opportunity to be mentored by and, and offer mentorship to a much broader group of people than just those you grew up with. And so I'm an advocate for intentional community and crafting social structures that really allow transmission of knowledge and support in ways that we don't do so well in the U.S. today. Thank you very much. Uh, I know now what I did because you both showed the book, so I thought that we did it all. <laughs> I just reflected. I said, why did I do that? Okay, my apologies to practically because I thought that was done as a joint. Over to you, please. Um, and so a book that I love is called The Doctrine of Karma, and it takes you through the various uh, in, in interpretations of karma uh, over different uh, you know, religion and spiritual uh, advocacy. Um, so I love that book because it actually does... Uh, uh, give open up your eyes to uh, things that are not being talked about in an everyday space anymore, even, even as meditation has become a big thing. Um, in terms of mentorship, I think that uh, I, I'm the chief strategy officer of the National Women's Parliament, which is quite a large body in uh, in uh, India. It's a it's a quasi government body which mobilizes women, um, and uh, I think you know, in that we bring so many women together to actually mentor other women. It's it's women for women. And uh, it's it, there's it's incredible to see young, you know, 20, 25 year olds aspiring to do more than just get married, <laughs> which is what the, the keynote is. I mean, you educate yourself to be good enough to get married. And now it's like they're breaking that paradigm because it's all about empowering them for social democracy uh, and uh, that kind of mentorship. But you see uh, girls being led by girls and. And you see them coming together, it just brings a smile to your face. And, and you know that there's so much more that you can do in this space by actually empowering them because that's bringing back more than 50%, because we actually have more women than men in India, more than 50% of, of uh, employees back into the workforce. So it's quite exciting. Fascinating. Thank you very much. I have a book that I like to share as well. Um, and it's written by Professor uh, Nigel Nicholson, and it's called I Leadership. And says strategies all being seeing being. because we all do every day seeing 
the being and the doing. So be the being, see the, see the being. Uh, and I think it's a fascinating book that kind of brings a lot of the things that we are discussing. Um, we have one question. Uh, I'll ask the second one as well, but this question just came. We have all been restricted to our local communities in the past year. However, as world, we are more connected than ever. How can we ensure that the valuable enlightening experiences we have had this year reflect a global position? Well, I can take, I can start uh, and then you jump in. It's a, it's a very difficult one. Very difficult one. Uh, and actually that's part of the, my research. Uh, the research I'm doing now is on the social brain. Uh, is there anything as a social brain? And yes, there is, but most of it is, is under consciousness. It's below consciousness. That's why when we go, if we really want to achieve something at the global level, we have to start with every single individual. That's the only way. Because otherwise, we'll never achieve anything global. So uh, it's a complex issue, but my recommendation is that if you want to change anything at the global level, let's start with yourself. Because that's the shortcut. That's the shortcut. The moment you focus on yourself and you change yourself, you change your community. And the moment the community changes, you change the collective. But that's the that's the only way you can change something at the global level. That's fascinating. Maybe one more person if she wants to if you want to touch base, because technically we are finishing now, but we can extend uh, one more. Anyone else on the same point? I think that was well covered. The the second question I'll ask whoever wants to answer it. I mean, we have very little time, but I think it was yeah. We had number of, uh, just one second. It feels like the summer marks a kind of worldwide revitalization post COVID. How can this feeling of renewal and change be harnessed and brought to its full potential? Just anyone who would like to answer this for the audience. How can this feeling of renewal and change be harnessed and brought to its full potential? I, th I just want to like emphasize what Louise just said, because I think always when we talk about changing the world, you know, we talk about changing communities, but we have to talk about how can each and one change ourselves and do something ourselves. So I think like sustainable change needs to start, start at individual level before it goes to the collective. So yeah, I, I think that is, would be my, my input as well. Absolutely. And I have one philosophy that you kind of make me realize more so. Um, I believe that we are consciously empowered to empower in our being, living, giving, to grow to our full potential, both individually and collectively, by integrating philosophical, entrepreneurial, and philanthropic values mentor to mentor, peer to peer, and we look at deal to deal, but we want to reach many to many. And that kind of the happiest moment in our world, I think, is the moment that you feel empowered and you empower somebody else is the happiest moment. It doesn't matter what it is. It just enlightens you right there because it's the sense of the giving. I like to take the opportunity to congratulate the panelists, our audience and the strategic partners, the organizers, the co-organizers, and especially Dr. Frank in uniting global stakeholders for unparalleled experience to navigate advancing sustainable development and build towards a resilient future for the global public good. I think it's important to reflect upon our, our individual and collective evolutionary journey, starting with our immediate family, growing with our friends and acquaintances, with our communities, countries, and continents. Let us evolve and grow uh, together with purpose, reaching out many to many by expanding, planting the seeds, cultivating the roots, and nurturing and sharing fruits. Continuing the Horace's, I think, tradition, let us capture the moment and take a group selfie to share the Dr. Frank and Horace's community. Say <laughs> Frank, <laughs> and we'll see if we can get this one done. Uh, there we go. <laughs> I think this will do. That's that's how far I got. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, 
I, it wasn't as good as I wanted, but say I think be safe, well, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Really nice to meet you all. And thank, look forward to being you. in person. Thank you very much. Thank you. you. Nice to meet you all. Nice Take to meet care. you all. Thank you. Take care. See yeah. you. Bye. Um, should I go? What's going on there?